bring us to, I believe, some of the greatest verses that's ever been written. And I'll just tell you what it is. Verses 11 through 16 are some of the most awesome uh, verbs and usages of the English language explaining the return of Christ that you could ever hear. But before that, Alex, we have in verse 1, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our Lord. Then in verse 3, again they shouted, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And then in verse 4, the latter part of verse 4, amen, hallelujah. Praise our God and all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. And then finally in verse 6, it says, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. What a verse. These, uh, this is praise and notice uh, we have left earth, which we have in chapter 18, and we go back into heaven. That's one of the most important things you'll do in studying the book of Revelation. Make sure you know uh, where you're at when you're reading. And here it says, heaven shouting, and they give the four hallelujahs. Uh, what praise there is to what God is doing, isn't it? Well, amen. Amen. 19 and 20 are just so amazing. And folks, please stay with us for this whole show if you would, because there there's a lot to go through here. You'll see chapter 19 really, really um, comes in sections. Uh, it begins with the first few verses. Uh, the hallelujah chorus is really sung in, in heaven. The angels are singing. And um, the, the first several verses really are kind of a, a restatement of something we see back in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32 that talks about the righteousness of God and uh, God in his righteousness judges the nations. And what's being judged here is Babylon. And verse 3 says, as they praise the judgment over evil, godless world systems that Altogether is called Babylon. It says, her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, the her in verse 3 is really Babylon. Remember the harlot. And so here, Bert, remember in 17 and 18, there was a, a distinction really between the political and religious system, Babylon, and the economic uh, system. Well, here, collectively, uh, as judgment has fallen, the trumpets have sounded Babylon and the godless anti-Christ world system is destroyed. Her smoke rises up forever and ever, and the the angels are praising God that justice was served. Now, here's what I want to say. Don't you agonize sometimes that, that it just seems like this world is very unjust. How could it be that America was created as a godly nation, and now in a public school you can't even post the Ten Commandments or a picture of Jesus. How can it be that uh, what we used to condemn we now condone? Uh, Bert, as a Christian, um, and just whether you're a Christian or not, don't you in the human heart, you want to see the right prevail. You want to see justice done. And we don't see a lot of that in this in this season of the world's history, do we? It has changed completely in my lifetime. And uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s, you saw righteousness prevail. Yes, there was evil and enemy, but yet virtue was uh, proclaimed as an honorable way of living. We're living in a time when virtue of the character of man is is looked at as something that's diminished and not proclaimed. And so the hallelujah is coming from the point of view. I, I refer back to the last part of verse 2, Alex, because it says, He, God, has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Yes. You know, hallelujah, right does prevail. And, and I, I want and, our listeners to understand, it's not necessarily, oh, boy, they're getting theirs. Oh, boy, exactly. they are. Yeah, it is righteousness does prevail and all that we've preached and proclaimed as messengers of God about the righteousness of God because he says be holy for I am holy we find out it really God really meant that didn't he he really did and and again um, you know we don't take any joy in the fact that people are going to die and go to hell um, you know, it's been said that if you're going to preach the gospel in fire and brimstone, you should also be able to wipe tears out of your eyes because of, of our grief that some are lost, and that is true. But, you know, even little children on the playground, 
if somebody cheats, little children, it, we're hardwired. We'll say, hey, that's not fair. We, we know when things are not right, and we desire for things to be right, and, and it will be. And the whole host of heaven will praise God when fully and finally evil is judged and sin is, is condemned. Do you know, Bert, uh, I was reading today that in France, there's a new secular school curriculum that they're putting forth throughout the French public schools, and it's, it's teaching young people um, morality from a secular perspective, although really without God you can't really have morality, at least not objective, absolute morality, but brace yourself. They said also they're teaching uh, young people to be wary of things like terrorist religious fanatics and those who believe in creation. Mm. Now, we in in the Christian faith, we we cringe when we think that those who reject evolution and believe creation would be lumped in the same group with terrorists. That's not right. Well, let me say, friends, this gospel is true. Compelling lines of evidence point to the reality of God's word. Jesus is God incarnate, risen Savior, and lovingly, consistently, faithfully, you keep on standing up for what's true because truth wins in the end. And Revelation 19, 1 through 6 alludes to that. And so there's so much more we could say, but um, shall we move on just a bit? Yeah, before, let's make sure we get to verse 6 because what you just said just says amen to that. And that is, hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. And amen. Praise the Lord. That's what you're saying, Alex. And I just wanted to make sure that that that's not just us talking. But notice what it says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. What in the world is this going on? A bride, a wedding in heaven? Alex, is this uh, something that's a little bit different than we've had in anywhere in the book of Revelation? Uh, what's going on in heaven here? Is there a wedding taking place? Well, you know, there's there's going to be a, a <laughs> wedding, and there's going to be a, a coronation of a king. And, you know, uh, think about a bride on her wedding day. You know, every bride is beautiful. As a preacher, I've done my share of weddings, and, you know, it's, it's just beautiful to see uh, a, a bride and a groom on their wedding day. And the, the bride puts on that white dress and walks down the aisle. Um, wouldn't it be um, unseemly and out of place for a bride to come down the middle aisle and have, um, oh, you know, work boots on covered in mud? Uh, that, that would just be out of place. Or let's say you've got the bride in the white dress and instead of a, a bouquet of beautiful flowers, she's holding some weeds or something like that. Uh, the bride makes herself ready. And, and I would submit to you, Bert, that the bride of Christ, which is the body of all believers... Um, all Christians make up the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. We need to make ourselves ready. We should not be a bride with muddy feet. And it just may be someone listening here today, uh, you're a Christian, you're born again, but there's some parts of your life that have not really been handed over to the lordship of Jesus. And let me say, we are going to face Christ one day, and this is not about salvation or lostness, because uh, whether you go to heaven or hell determines if you've opened your heart to Jesus. But there is the time we face Christ, and there's rewards, there's loss of rewards. And so, uh, bride, make yourself ready. Um, prep, and make sure your garments are clean, and your, your feet are on the right path. And, and I think uh, we as the bride... Mindful of the fact that we're going to meet our bridegroom, we need to make ourselves ready, Bert. I think so. We need to be without spot and without blemish because we've confessed all of our sins and he has cleansed us from all unrighteousness and now we're presented as white as snow. Praise the Lord for the joy of knowing Christ and knowing our sins are forgiven. That brings us to, again, what I, I think we're ready about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's taking place, the coronation, the celebration. But are mm. you ready to go to verse 11, or do you want to say something about 9 and 10, Alex? Well, I think it's interesting, verse 10. Okay, there's this marriage supper of the Lamb, which, folks, very interesting. I wrote a whole book on Joseph in Genesis 37 through 45. Remember Joseph, um, uh, so many parallels between Jesus and Joseph. Uh, Joseph emerged alive from an intended grave. 
Jesus emerged alive from an intended grave. Joseph was sold for the price of a slave in his day, 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for the price of a slave in his day, 30 pieces of silver. But Joseph had a supper and gave gifts to his family when he got reunited with his family. Jesus is going to have a supper and give gifts uh, to those that are in his family, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And friends, if you're born again, you'll be there. But look at this. When John is seeing all these things, he falls at the feet of the angel who is showing him these things and, and is uh, going to worship. I mean, even the angel who's the, the messenger is so beautiful, it just apparently prompts John to want to worship. The angel says, see thou do it not. But listen to this as verse 10 ends. The angel says to John, I'm your fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, Bert, there's so much we could say, but let me simply say this. Um, only the gospel of Jesus has the eternal truth of the meaning of life, the, the key to heaven, the the understanding of the universe, the spirit of, of the proclamation of truth. And, and G.K. Chesterton said this of the gospel of Jesus. Chesterton lived 100 years ago. He said, nobody else has any good news for the simple reason nobody else has any news. If you know Jesus, you've heard the spirit of prophecy or proclamation of truth. This is the one and only true message. There is no other gospel. Acts 4.12, uh, it's not a fable, Second Peter 1.16. Bert, aren't you glad that in meeting the testimony of Jesus, or, or receiving the testimony of Jesus, you've also heard and responded to the spirit of prophecy? That is good news. And if you're listening today and you do not have the assurance that, that you're right with God, the only way to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. So we want you to know that you can go to a website that, that AFA provides. It's knowhim.afr.net. Again, knowhim, K-N-O-W, knowhim.afr.net. And you'll find information there that will help you to know Christ, help you grow in Christ. And we want you to go there so you can be all that God wants you to be in Him. This is Exploring the Word on AFR Talk. Alex McFarlane, Bert Harper with you. We're going to come back in two minutes with some of the greatest scriptures you'll ever find. Welcome to Holy Land Moments, presented by the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. As Israel honors the memories of the six million Jews killed during the Holocaust, we also remember with Holocaust survivor Martin Weiss, who tells the story of his arrival at Auschwitz, the largest Nazi killing center. Of course, we never heard of the crematoriums. We never heard of anything like this. But anyway, we went through, uh, we were picked, uh, my father and some of my relatives and a lot of people from my town. We went through the line. I was not that big. I was like just about 15 years old. I was actually small for my age. But it turned out to be I was the only one from the boys at my age to come through. From about 30, 35 boys, all of them went to their death the first night we came to Auschwitz. And the reason I attributed it to, I put on like two, three jackets because they told us about work. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make like, myself look bigger, and somehow I passed. Uh, so we went through the showers. We came out on the other side. They cut all our hair off. They gave us uh, striped clothes, and they took us to the barracks. They put in uh, 12 people in a bunk, believe it or not. We had to sleep then. And we could also smell flesh burning. And then we saw the chimneys. And all of a sudden, at that, that time, somebody found out what it was, and they told us what happened. And so by next morning, when we saw the, those fires, uh, we realized all our families were already going up in smoke by that time. You've been listening to an excerpt from Holocaust survivor Martin Weiss on today's edition of Holy Land Moments. Today, there remain nearly 200,000 Holocaust survivors living in Israel, and nearly a third living under the poverty line. To learn more about how you can help those Holocaust survivors, visit holylandmoments.org. That's holylandmoments.org. This is AFR Talk, and the program is Exploring the Word. Dr. Alex McFarland.